Today is August 4th, 2021, and my guest is historian Brett Devereaux of the University of North Carolina. His blog is A Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry, a look at history and popular culture. It's a rather unusual collection of observations on history and popular culture. It's certainly pedantic. It's also esoteric. Quite interesting. Really enjoyed uh, exploring it. And our conversation today will draw on some of his recent posts on Rome, Sparta, and history generally. I want to start with a, perhaps a strange question. Why do you think so many people are interested in Rome and Greece? And, and why is Brett Devereux interested? I mean, it's, it's a long time ago. Uh, they're all gone. They're dead. Why do we care? Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I, I think there are a number of answers to this question, but I think the core of why people are interested in Rome and Greece is that there is still very much a popular sense, and I think there is quite a bit of justification for this, that Rome and Greece in particular serve as the foundation for the sort of society we have now. Um, whatever one wants to whatever one wants to call that. Um, I think this is true. There's a degree to which I think the contributions of other societies, um, particularly in the Near East and Egypt, are somewhat undervalued in that story of how we get to the society we have now. But the observation that Greece and Rome are pivotal points in the uh, creation of the sort of society we have um, are not invalid. I mean, we, after all, live in a republic. That's a Roman term. It's a democracy. That's a Greek term. Um, you know, there is some there is some justification for this, even if um, you know perhaps the uh, somewhat old old fashioned kind of Western civ narrative oversimplifies the role of 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 Greece and Rome. For me, it just because you ask why I'm interested in, in Rome, I've always been interested in the complex dynamics of very large, complicated states. And Rome in particular is a very large, complicated state. It's an extremely successful state. Um, the Romans build a very large empire in very difficult terrain. It lasts a long time. And perhaps most bizarrely, the people who begin as its victims end as its defenders which suggests to me that the Romans were doing something right, uh, intentionally or not. And so I've always been interested in this question of, of, of what and what the impact of that empire is. Although I will note that actually studying the Roman Empire up close, a bit of the rose-tinted glasses tend to come off. The Romans are not nice people. <laughs> so who are the, uh, the people that they were tough on who became their defenders, and why do you say they're not nice people? Um, so I mean, most of the, most of the empire, um, you know, s ends up serving in the in the Roman army. It's really striking that um, you have, uh, you know, the the Roman Empire, particularly in the West. Um, I think this is Guy Halsall's line: um, "Didn't go quietly; it went down, kicking, screaming, and gouging," um, which is accurate. And most of that kicking and screaming and gouging was not done by people from Italy, although some of it was. It was done by soldiers recruited from uh, today France, the Romans would have called Gaul, Spain, the Near East, North Africa, Greece. These were all imperial possessions, places the Romans had conquered, exploited for tax money. Um, so the, the great, 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 great descendants of, say, the Gauls that are brutalized by Julius Caesar in his – it is quite nasty conquest of Gaul, you know, their descendants are – the guys stocking the Roman armies in the fourth century, in the fifth century, defending the frontiers, defending the empire. By that point, they're all Roman citizens. Um, and of course, the descendants of those people will spend most of the Middle Ages trying to breathe the Roman Empire back to life, right? You have the, the Holy Roman Empire, Charlemagne's Empire. These are all efforts to recreate the Roman Empire in the West. And the same is true, of course, in the East. Um, you know, the Roman state will continue to exist in Greece and Anatolia as the Byzantine Empire it will hang on till 1453, defended entirely by people who would have been the conquered subjects of Rome when the Romans first showed up. And so it's really quite striking that, um, you know, the Roman conquest could be, it, it was brutal and traumatic. Um, and we should never, we should never ignore that. And the Romans themselves could be quite 
cynical and mercenary about the people they conquered, the Romans were in it for the money. Um, they had no grand dreams of bringing together humankind. Um, the Romans weren't there to spread Roman civilization or citizenship. They were there to conquer you so that they could impose taxes and tribute on you and take your stuff. Um, now, taking your stuff, of course, required administration. It required establishing law and order. Um, taking your stuff most efficiently, it was helpful if you lived in cities and were reasonably well established and so on. And so over time, in order to most efficiently take your stuff, the Romans tended to do all of these other things. And then as a result became over centuries quite well regarded by the people that they conquered. And those people came into Roman citizenship, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little more in a bit, um, and eventually identified with the Roman Empire and saw it as theirs. It was their country um, you know, that the barbarians were at the gates of. Um, and that's really, that's really remarkable. That's really exceptional. Well, I would just point out that you know, there is a Monty Python skit about this from the life of Brian. Yes. I encourage – we'll put a link up to it if, if we can, copyright-wise. If we can't, just Google what have the Romans ever done for us. You'll find it. It's one of John Cleese's better moments. But I think there's a really – I may use it in my classes. Oh, who wouldn't? Uh, it's it's great. It's phenomenal. But it, remi it raises an interesting question, your your uh, observations. And you know, we think about modern empires. You can think about the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. You think about modern China even where the ability of a modern state to control enormous swaths of land is somewhat limited. Uh, they do the best they can. They use the power of the state. They use the power of weapons co and to coerce people. But Rome, you know, the Roman Empire persists for hundreds of years over thousands of square miles without real communication, right? No internet, no phone, uh, no nightly news to see that there's trouble brewing in um, – in Jerusalem, and I, you know, I'm in Jerusalem right now. I'm thinking, you know, the Jews revolted against the Romans. It didn't end well. A couple times. It didn't end well, but it's uh, it's surprising how few did that. Uh, did they? W one answer would be they. Life was fairly decent, and maybe even better than it had been before. And so you just lived with the as a Roman uh, under the Roman Empire. But there must have been other ways that the Romans uh, kept revolts down. Um, and people yearning to be free for whatever. In the case of the Jews, it was religious reasons, but there were national reasons, um, self-determination a little bit maybe. Uh, why were they so able to administer such an enormous amount of territory so successfully over so long a period of time? So the Romans make a, a virtue of necessity in this. I mean, you talk about how modern states, uh, you know, modern states can be very invasive. Uh, right now, the modern Chinese state is going into the, you know, Tibetan, Mongolian, and Uyghur uh, populations and attempting to really change their culture and obliterate elements of their religion and their way of life. Um, the Romans, that's just not practical. Um, they don't have the state infrastructure to try and do that. So there, there are a few exceptions. Uh, if your religion includes human sacrifice, the Romans will try and stamp it out. Um, but for the most part, um, when the Romans move into your area and conquer it, right, they're there for the tax money. So they don't care about how you live, your local customs. You keep those. Um, that's fine. Just pay taxes. Roman administration on the ground is actually very thin. Um, and so instead, what the Romans tend to do is they tend to say, okay, well, what were you paying in taxes before? All right, you now pay that, but to us. Um, Whatever your local government was, your town government, that continues running. You had local laws. What was your you know, local law against theft or what have you? Keep that. Um, the only exceptions the Romans uh, put on that is, is sentences of, of death or exile have to get checked off by the governor, um, something that right, occurs in the, in the New Testament and is a big rigmarole as <laughs> they try and figure out jurisdiction. Um, but for, for petty crimes, you know, uh, if, if, if King Herod or the Sanhedrin wants to make that decision, fine, they don't care. Um, you know, and so uh, that degree of local autonomy, um, you know, means that not a lot changes for your average farmer when the Romans show up. Um, where, where the Romans tend to get the buy-in um, is they tend to work through elite culture. 
And here, I think the big advantage is that the Greek and Latin literary culture comes to unite elites, the very wealthy, the educated, across society over the whole Mediterranean. So all those folks are reading Homer. They're all reading Virgil, the same as their Roman overlords are. Um, and now that's a thin strata on the top of society, but it's an influential strata on the top of society. The regular people are probably taking their cues from their elites. And the elites have some things in common with Roman elites. They can talk to, with them about the finer interpretation of Ovid. And, and so Roman uh, culture, Roman values, they tend to percolate from the Roman elite who are running these provinces through the provincial elite, you know, this thin educated stratum on top, and then down because, of course, the people below are taking their cues from their local elites, from the, the big man who owns the big farm. And it's a slow process, um, but it's an effective one. Um, and there certainly are areas that are, are restive, um, that, that don't take as well um, to Roman control. Uh, the province of Judea, right? Modern Israel, Palestine is a, is a big problem for the Romans. Um, uh, England, uh, Britain is, is restive. Um, and, um, and, and also has issues. But for the most part, revolts against Roman rule are rare because Roman rule doesn't change very much um, for people on the ground. That's fascinating. The Romans don't try and change much. So I'm going to raise a general question, which you write eloquently about in a, in a post we'll link to, which is our knowledge of ancient society is very limited. You write the following. As folks are generally aware, the amount of historical evidence available to historians decreases the further back you go into his, in history. This has a real impact on how historians are trained. My go-to metaphor in explaining this to students is that a historian of the modern world has to learn how to sip from a fire hose of evidence, while the historian of the ancient world must learn how to find water in the desert. Um, it's really a fantastic image. And one of the things we're going to talk about in our time today is the gap between the reality of, of Rome or Greece and how they're portrayed in popular culture. And the question arises, well, how do we know what they really were like? So you're, you're going to point out that it's fascinating that the way the Romans or, or Greeks are portrayed in, in miniseries and movies are often grossly misleading. But that means you have some understanding of what it was actually like, which is we don't have their movies. Um, they haven't survived. So how do we know anything about day-to-day -day life in Rome or in the Roman Empire or in Sparta or Athens? What are our sources? Where do they come from? Right. No, and it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so compared to other ancient societies, Greece and Rome are relatively well documented, but that means far less than any modern society. Um, the sort of base, the foundation of our knowledge are the literary sources. These are uh, written works um, written during the period by the Greeks or the Romans, um, which survived to the present. Now, they survived to the present because they were painstakingly copied by hand um, through the Middle Ages until the age of, of print. Um, uh, how many are Often there? How many are there, Brett? There aren't very many. You you write about not, it. Not very many. The I, I I like to note that the Loeb Library in Greek and Latin is is just over five hundred volumes. Uh, it's not five hundred works, but five hundred little volumes. Um, they're little red and green volumes. You see these; they're very distinctive. Um, there are about five hundred of them, and that's it. That's it. That that's basically <laughs> it. There are a handful of works that aren't that don't yet have a Loeb, but only a handful. Um, uh, you know, it is, it is mostly complete. Um, you can fit the entire corpus of Greek and, and, and Roman writing, um, on, on one sort of five foot wide, five foot tall series of bookshelves. Um, and, and that's, and that's it, um, that survives. And, uh, the, the popular notion that you will get is this idea that this is because Greek and Roman literature was somehow suppressed in the middle ages that, oh, the church wanted to get rid of it. This is not the case. The church was actually part of what was preserving it. Although many works also survived outside of the Christian world, 
Um, Muslim scholars were also preserving classical texts. The issue is when you have to copy these things by hand, that's a lot of time and a lot of labor. And you, you only have so much, particularly in the environment immediately after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, society is much poorer for a while. And so only the most important things get copied. And that's the most important things as judged by the people at the time. And so you have this limited body of texts. Um, if one of those authors answers your question, great. Uh, if none of them do, um, you may be out of luck. Um, we then work to sort of supplement that body of, of, of texts um, in other ways. I think the most notable is archeology. span People will be familiar with this. We dig in the ground and unearth uh, ancient settlements, uh, graves and so on for evidence. Um, archeology span is really good because it gives us a firm base of evidence. Literary sources can be deceptive. They can lie to you. They can have their own agendas. Um, but archeology span can give you pretty firm data um, in terms of like this object was here at this given date for sure. Um, and so you can nail things down very securely that way. The downside is that archeology span is limited by preservation. Only a tiny fraction of the objects that existed are preserved. They're not preserved evenly. So by way of example, let's say you wanna know about trade in the ancient world. Well, if you're using archeology, span good news. We know a lot about trade in olive oil and wine in the Roman world. Why? Well, because olive oil and wine both moved in amphora, the clay vessels, big pots. Um, these amphora were disposable. So when your giant pot of wine reached its end point, you poured it into bottles and then you just chucked the big transport pot. And based on, and because pottery survives, right, it's indestructible. Like you can shatter it to itty bitty pieces, but those itty bitty pieces are still there. We can reconstruct the pot. We can look at the forms of these amphora and also sometimes stamps and inscriptions on these amphora. And we can tell where they're from and how they moved to get to where they went. Um, and of course we know where they ended up because that's where we find them. And so you can chart for olive oil and wine, all of these wonderful trade networks. Let's say you want, instead, you're interested in grain. Well, I have bad news for you. Grain moves in sacks and sacks do not survive like pots. And the grain itself probably doesn't either. Um, and so you're left with what the literary sources tell you, um, which is not nothing when it comes to grain, um, but, but you don't have the ability to sort of archeologically draw out these complex networks. And then there are some questions that archaeology just cannot answer. Um, imagine things about your life and how they're archaeologically visible. Um, you know, did you did you go see a movie? Um, well, the fact that you went and saw the movie is not going to be archaeologically visible. What movie you saw is not going to be archaeologically visible. What we will be able to tell 2,000 years from now is that there was a movie theater there. We'll be able to create a really precise floor plan of the movie theater. We will be able to tell people what movie theaters were shaped like we will not be able to tell them what the movie was shown that day. And so it's, it's very, it's very uneven. Um, and, but there's also uh, the other thing I like is you talk about, and you know, this happens in Israel all the time. You know, somebody finds a coin or a lintel, a piece of a support thing, and there'll be mm -hmm. four letters carved on it. And people then use Google to finish up the rest of the <laughs> word and make some bold claim about, you know, when the second temple was built or destroyed or whatever. Right. So there's, there is some creativity in this, but, but in general, finding inscriptions carved into stone is a pretty um, reliable thing that does stick around. Right. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of work um, that, uh, you know, getting from a piece of stone that has something written on it to something that we can talk about uh, is the job of epigraphers. Um, epigraphers. Is that what they're mind? called? Um, yeah, epigraphers. Good name. Um, no, it, it really is. Uh, classics, uh, study of the ancient world has lots of really good names. Um, often you're dealing with texts that are fragmentary. Um, you know, they put up a, a, a big stone steely, so it's a big stone slab, and they wrote a law down on it. And over the years, half of the slab is worn away. So you're missing the back half of every line. Um, and, uh, you know, really experienced, well-trained epigraphers can do some magic in, you know, well, I know that, you know, they'll know the normal formulations for these laws and, 
how many letters of space they have in that missing stone and they'll start filling in words. Um, that is not what I do. So that <laughs> seems to me like magic, but, um, but it is really valuable. Um, and fortunately for us, the Greeks and the Romans were both really fond of inscribing important things into stone. These aren't generally literary texts. They're usually legal texts, laws, pronouncements, edicts. Um, but those can be really valuable, um, though they often arrive to us without a lot of context. So you just have, here's the law uh, of, you know, here are the port regulations for the port you're standing in. Um, and then remember that it's like half of them because it's, it's broken up. Um, but you can still learn some things from, from that information, especially when you get a very large corpus of inscriptions. And we have many tens of thousands of inscriptions from the Greek and, and Roman world. And you can start putting those together and, um, and, and get some real information, though, again, it's imperfect. For uh, ancient Athens, all we have to work on for their laws, by and large, are a collection of legal speeches that are preserved in the literary sources and a lot of inscriptions that record laws. For the Romans, we have a complete law code um, because early on in the Byzantine period, they wrote one down. And consequently, we can't reconstruct the whole body of, of Greek law in, in Athens. Uh, every Greek state would have had its own legal codes. Um, but for the Romans, we can be really confident. Uh, I, I can talk, we can talk at length about obscure points of Roman law and how they functioned um, in a way that we cannot do for Greece. And so epigraphy is really valuable, but it can also leave pretty substantial blind spots. And the other thing I just want to point out really quick, you mentioned, you know, someone finds that coin and makes arguments about it. Um, I cringe a little because, of course, they find that coin and they lift it up out of the ground. Um, the act of lifting it up out of the ground has destroyed that coin in some important ways. Um, because for archaeologists, for epigraphers, for the numismatists, who are the coin specialists, we have every kind of specialist, I swear. Um, knowing exactly where that coin is from, its exact position in the ground, how deep underground it was, was it next to anything else, is extremely important. And if you remove an ancient artifact without documenting, right, an archaeologist will carefully document so that none of that is lost. But if you remove it without documenting any of that information, that information is lost. And there are a tremendous number, um, because there is a robust, unfortunately, antiquities black market. Sure. There's a tremendous number of objects from antiquity that have been ripped out of their, we call it provenance, ripped mm -hmm. out of their provenance. The results are far less valuable to us in terms of understanding the past um, because we can't put them in a place in a time. Well, let's turn – that was fantastic, uh, and I learned something uh, useful – which I mean, learned many useful things from that. But one of the things I learned is I always thought it was pronounced steel, but it's steely. These are – should describe what those steely, are yep. actually. Tell, tell listeners what and viewers what those are. What is a steely? Right. So, yeah. So a steely is a, um, is a, is a stone monument, typically a flat slab, the purpose of which is to hold an inscription. And so it's just going to be a nice vertical block of stone. They're often quite large. The Rosetta, uh, the Rosetta Stone, I assume, is a steely. Yes, is a good yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I've also seen – one. I, yeah, I saw it at the British Museum. I also saw – one of my favorite things is the Cylinder of Cyrus, which is a football-shaped oh, yeah. clay item object, which there were – I don't know how many there were, but they sent them out. It's like a, a notice um, mm -hmm. saying uh, – it was actually about the Jews were able to go back to, 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 to Judea and to – uh, Israel, uh, that we have actually the actual thing, not like right. a fragment, one little piece where we had to interpolate. It's an amazing thing. I don't know how many there were, but it's cool. No, I mean, there are some, there are some truly amazing documents that we have um, in, in inscriptions, um, whether it's um, two copies of the Treaty of Kadesh, the world's oldest known peace treaty, which is fascinating. We have- Where um, When was that signed? And where? Uh, Battle of Kadesh is the 1200s BC. We're out in the Bronze Age, wow. late Bronze Age. And um, I should know the exact date. I teach the Battle of Kadesh, but I don't off the top of my head. That's okay. Um, we, I don't think any less of you, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but fascinatingly, um, so this is a treaty between the Hittite Empire and the New Kingdom of, of Egypt. Um, 
in, in, in the Bronze Age. So for people thinking this is pre-biblical times, um, uh, you know, the kingdom of Israel does not exist yet at this point historically. Um, and, and the fascinating thing is that we have two versions of the treaty um, we have from, um, from the archives at Hattushas, um, we actually have the Hittite copy of the treaty um, written in uh, Akkadian cuneiform, which is the standard diplomatic language of the time. And then in Egypt, um, we have a hieroglyphics translation of the treaty on a temple wall. Whoa. Um, and, and they match. Um, and so this name treaty. That's incredibly useful, of course. For translation yeah. and interpretation. It's also fascinating because we also have a battle, an account of the battle that leads to the treaty. The treaty comes some 10 years later, but the major battle of the war, the Battle of Kadesh, um, uh, again inscribed um, on a temple wall in, in Egypt. Um, the amusing thing is that the Egyptians represent this battle as a tremendous, overwhelming victory, which just reading the treaty makes it obvious it's not. It was kind of a debacle <laughs> and a bloody draw. And then, so we have this work of propaganda about the battle. Yeah, that's um, awesome. A good reminder that our ancient sources occasionally fib to us. Yes, it does. Um, yeah, uh, skepticism is always in order. Uh, let's <laughs> let's talk about Rome. You have a series of essays, uh, which I very much enjoyed, and you start with the observation that um, in most representations in movies and miniseries of the, the Roman Empire, the actors speak. The Queen's Latin. Explain what you mean by that, and and what the point. Why you bring that up? Yeah. So I, I started with this observation, and this is something I've been I've been noticing for a while. And I didn't invent the phrase "the Queen's Latin." Um, I'm not the first person to coin that. Um, that the tendency, at least in in English speaking, um, film and TV and video games, is to represent the Romans. And this goes back, even if you look at the old sword and sandal epics of the 1950s, they do this. The Romans are represented with British actors speaking with um, very proper British accents. Um, and, um, and they do so like it's very intentional and they're very homogenous. They all have the same Roman accent. And this is my joke, right? They don't speak the Queen's English. They speak the Queen's uh, Latin. And I think that this has come to influence the way that the public imagines Rome and what we think about when we think of the Romans to the point that the occasionally accurate depiction of the Romans strikes people as wrong. And you will get all sorts of people on the internet complaining that they, that they did it wrong. And there was a recent, um, there was a recent show. I can't even remember which, which show it was um, where uh apparently briefly was glimpsed a black Roman soldier in Roman Britain. And parts of the internet had a fit. Um, and I was sitting here banging my head on a desk because we know there were black Roman soldiers in Roman Britain. <laughs> um, uh, it's not always the most reliable source, but the Historia Augustus, Augusta, a, a history of some of the later Roman emperors, flat out tells us that Septimius Severus runs into one in Britain. Um, so this is not a matter of of debate. I mean, we we know, and and to people it it struck them as so bizarre and unreal because I think that the Romans looked more or less like the House of Lords, um, <laughs> in 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 Britain. And of course, the Romans didn't look like that. in togas. In, of in, in togas, in togas. Yeah. Um, and, and of course they didn't. I in in that post I kept using the screenshot of HBO's Rome in the Senate um, because they're all you'll pardon me they're all very white um, and we know that some Romans had very fair complexions um, but of course uh, if you've been to Italy um, most Italians do not look like Northern Europeans um, right they have that classic uh, olive skin tone. Um, and of course, the Roman Empire was a Mediterranean empire, um, which means it included parts of Africa, um, it included parts of Asia, um, you know, Western Western Asia, and those people were often Romans too. And by the first and second century, they're showing up in the Senate. Um, and so, you know, the mental image of Romans, I mean, absolutely, it should include Romanized Gauls and Britons who would have been presumably 
quite white, but lots of Italians, North Africans, Egyptians, um, some number of sub-Saharan Africans end up inside the Roman Empire. That is very clear, uh, again, fairly well established. Um, and not marginal people uh, either. Um, you know, I talk about um, uh, you know, Apuleius, uh, who uh, is a Roman author, writes in Latin, Roman citizen, upper class, um, writes the world's oldest complete surviving novel, um, uh, The Golden Ass. You can go read it. It's hilarious. It's a comedy. Um, dark comedy, but a comedy. Uh, not G-rated, but it's funny. Um, and um, he describes himself as, um, as half Numidian and half Gaetulian, two different North African peoples. Um, and he is from North Africa. It, it makes sense. Um, uh, uh, Fronto has a great line uh, in a letter to, uh, I believe it's to Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, um, where he describes himself as, I am a Libyan of the Libyan nomads, which is just a pretty flat declaration of like, yeah, no, he's really, he's really, he's African Roman. Uh, Fronto, to be clear, sat in the Roman Senate and was a tutor to emperors. Um, this is a man at the very pinnacle of Roman society. Um, in the High Roman Empire. And so the real Rome doesn't look very much like a BBC production of, of Rome. Uh, again, it's not that there aren't fair-skinned Romans. There are, um, but there are Romans from all over the Mediterranean world in all sorts of complexions, even within Rome and Italy, as a side note. And again, as anyone who has been to Italy will tell you, there's a wide range of complexions and physical appearances in Italy. Um, even just walking down a street in Rome today, you will see every, you know, every sort of, every sort of color of people. And one of the things I demonstrate, I can't do this on a podcast because I can't have pictures, um, but I go through a whole lot of Roman fresco to show that it wasn't any different, um, so, that, that Rome was a pretty, a pretty diverse place. So you, um, your description of the author of the Golden Ask, I, would you pronounce his name again? Uh, Apuleius. Apuleius. Okay. Uh, Apuleius. Because uh, it sure. got distorted. Yeah. It got distorted. So, um, yeah, why does this matter? I mean, it's lovely. You know, it's nice that they were diverse. It's interesting that HBO or the BBC or, I mean, I loved I Claudius, but when I was younger, I don't know if I could watch it now. It's, it's slow by modern standards. Love the book too, by the way. Robert Graves, love it. Loved it. I don't know if I could read it now, but it's an amazingly, I enjoyed it very much then. Uh, those people all look like um, – who played Claudius? What's his name? Oh, can't remember. Um, Derek, um, Derek Jacoby. Very pale person, extremely pale. Uh, and his fellow actors and actresses were also quite pale. So that's interesting. You know, it's nice. Why is it important? So I think it's important for a, a few reasons. The, the one that really prompted me to write the series is that often this misconception of the Romans as having been at some point in their past a homogenous and usually this is left unstated but often very crucial to the argument, a homogenous and white people um, gets used to perch all sorts of political arguments on. Um, most recently, perhaps noted, um, uh, Niall Ferguson, uh, noted historian, but notably not a historian of the ancient world. My colleague at the Hoover Institution. It's Neil, by the way. So Neil, it's carry, Neil. Okay. carry on. He made an argument that was really about um, migration into – contemporary migration into the European Union, um, but that – uh, mobilized the sort of understanding of the Romans as sort of the essentials of Romanness being lost as the barbarians migrated into Rome. Um, and you see forms of that argument in um, less carefully constructed ways, this idea that Rome begins as a homogenous community, expands on the strength of that homogenous community, becomes diverse, therefore becomes weak, therefore collapses as an argument against what are essentially multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic polities, right? This is an, uh, an argument in favor of the nation state and against multi-ethnic states. Um, but that's simply not, historically speaking, what happened. Rome was a multi-ethnic state at its outset. Um, 
we know from archaeology that even in sort of our earliest evidence for Rome, we're talking here now 900, 800 BC, the Roman Republic won't be founded until 509. So we're hundreds of years before even the Roman Republic, much less the Roman Empire, um, that we see that Rome is a frontier town. Um, Rome exists at the cultural meeting points of um, three different major cultural groups, the Latins to their south who speak one language, uh, it's the language the Romans will speak, Latin. Then the Sabines um, to their east and north, these are hill people, they speak a different Osco-Umbrian language, um, they're culturally distinct. Um, and then to their north, the Etruscans, who are perhaps the most different of the bunch, uh, they speak Etruscan, which is unrelated to any living language. Um, it is a non-Indo-European language, a holdover in Europe. Um, so the Etruscans have been in Etruria, we suppose, for a very long time indeed, longer than the Latins have been in Latium, for instance. The Etruscans have a different religious, a completely different religious system um, than most of the rest of Italy. They're a really different people. And Rome comes together at the meeting point of those cultural zones. And it isn't quite any of them. The Romans don't regard themselves as Latins, um, though they know that there are Latins among them. They don't regard themselves as Sabines, though they know that there are Sabines settled in Rome. Um, they certainly don't regard themselves as Etruscans, though, again, they adopt a lot of Etruscan culture. They're clearly Etruscans in the early Roman community. It seems that a number of Rome's early kings were Etruscan. Um, and so Rome begins as this, frankly, melting pot society. Um, you know, perched in between these cultural zones. That only increases as Rome expands. We tend to think of Italy, uh, particularly I think Americans tend to think of Italy as uh, the Italians are a single group of people. Um, I mean, one, you won't hear that if you ask any Italians. Um, ask some Northern Italians what they think of Sicilians um, and whether they think that they're the same, they have the same culture. Um, you know, uh, you'll get different stories. Um, but this was even more true um, in the Roman world. In many ways, the modern Italian identity that holds the country together is a creation of the Roman Empire. Um, it doesn't exist before it. And so when the Romans are expanding through Italy, they're dealing with Gauls, Etruscans, Greeks, Latins, Sabines, um, Samnites, um, and, and dozens of smaller peoples. Um, there are more than a dozen different languages spoken in pre-Roman Italy, three different religious systems. And the Romans aren't pushing these other people out. Um, that would defeat the purpose. The Romans are, and I do want to mention, they are always cynical opportunists. <laughs> um, and so, and what the Romans are interested in is developing military power. Um, and so, obviously, if you conquer a group of people, um, their manpower, their resources, you want to harness that for your military. So what the Romans do as they expand through Italy is they follow what I, I jokingly call the Goku model of imperialism. I beat you, therefore we are friends. I'm probably dating myself a little with that <laughs> reference. Um, um, but the, the Romans tend to they defeat a community, and it's congratulations, we beat you. Um, we're going to take some of your land. We're going to take a lot of your stuff. The process of conquest is going to be very unpleasant. You're now an ally of Rome. Um, when we go to war, you go to war with us. We have all the same friends, all the same enemies. Rome sets your foreign policy. Your soldiers now serve in our army, but that means you get loot when we win. Um, and, and this is how we're going to do it. And this is how Rome is able to build the deep well of military resources that enable them to, for instance, compete with Carthage in the Punic Wars, which are these knockdown, drag out fights. Um, the first Punic War goes from 264 to 241. Um, it's a 23 year long war. And to be clear, that's not one of these on again, off again, <laughs> you declare peace for a few years. And that is 23 years of continuous high intensity military operations. Um, the second Punic War isn't a whole lot shorter from 218 to 202. Um, and for 14 years of that, Hannibal has a Carthaginian army in Italy stomping around, smashing up Roman armies because he's an almost unbeatable general. Um, and the Romans are able to continue competing in that space because their alliance system 
gives them access to the manpower and resources of all of these non-Romans. And so it's the Roman management, it's successful Roman management of a diverse Italy that enables them to get their empire in the first place. And they don't stop doing this. Um, the Romans don't make allies when they go outside of Italy, they make provinces. Um, but they then promptly begin recruiting those provincials into the Roman army. Um, by the reign of Tiberius, the second emperor, we're told that half of the Roman army were the legions, which consisted of Italians. Now, all, by this point, all the Italians are Roman citizens, so these are the citizen legions. The other half of the Roman army were the auxilia, troops recruited from the provinces. Um, these are non-Roman citizens. Indeed, the reward for 20 years of service was getting citizenship. Um, that was one of the rewards for serving in the, in the auxilia. And these guys are drawn from all over the empire. Um, and so the Romans are very aggressive in trying to, uh, and again, it's, it's entirely cynical and opportunistic. They just want to win battles. Um, but to win battles, uh, they need to harness these diverse populations. And I don't think it's an accident that the political entity that ended up being the best and mobilizing resources from diverse populations in the ancient Mediterranean was itself a diverse city. That those patterns of thought that made you politically successful in a diverse, tumultuous city like Rome and Roman Italy are likely to be the patterns of thought that are going to make you successful at harnessing uh, diverse populations abroad. And again, this doesn't mean the Romans were tolerant. Um, <laughs> they often weren't. It certainly doesn't mean they were committed to tolerance. They weren't. Um, the Romans, if intolerance and brutality served Roman aims, they would do that too. Um, the Romans could be very savage conquerors. The process of becoming part of the Roman Empire was incredibly traumatic and brutal. Um, even in the ancient world, which was a pretty dog-eat-dog -dog place, the Romans had a reputation for being nasty. <laughs> That's a pretty um, good. I guess that tells you a lot. Um, I, I want to talk about warfare. Uh, I think you, you were critical in a recent set of, of posts about the idea that there's a universal warrior experience. And I, I was surprised to read that. I, I do tend to think – of war as having some incredible parallels across time and place, uh, being a sur being a soldier in war or being a warrior. And one of the things I thought was so interesting about your your piece was your dislike of conflating soldiers and warriors, because you know warrior is like a it's like a hipster word. In modern usage, it means like a really good soldier. A warrior is like a somehow you it 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 pulls up the image of a bulked up person with all kinds of weaponry and the ability to you know kind of like an Avenger uh, is a warrior in in the the Avengers. And you you I thought very thoughtfully critiqued the, first of all that confusing the two or conflating the two is similar. And made some important distinctions between soldiers and warriors. So let's talk about that first, why soldiers and warriors shouldn't be used as described as synonyms. And then we'll talk about why you talked about the non-universal nature of, of war. Yeah, um, you know, and this is something that uh, you certainly do encounter them, you know, the effort to use them as synonyms, sometimes really frustratingly. Um, the United States Army has, for the last you know decade and a half, had all sorts of warrior ethos stuff, which drives me up the wall. Um, right. So um, you know these words are different. Uh, you only need to think about um, trying to describe. We can use fictional examples. Trying to describe uh, Conan the Barbarian as a soldier, and that sounds wrong. You know that's wrong. He's not. He's a warrior. Um, or trying to describe uh, Private Ryan from Saving Private Ryan as a warrior, right? He's not. He's kind of a, a wimp, for one. Um, but two, um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. These are these are different. It, it actually goes back to the etymology. Um, warrior comes almost exactly where you th you think it does. A warrior is one who wars. Um, and we generally use this word to mean individuals who make war, we might say their profession or their vocation. It is core to their identity. 
and we see that in societies. We see that structure. Um, I use the example of a, of a medieval knight as a good example of a, of a warrior, particularly a late medieval knight. Um, this is an individual war is central to his identity. Um, it is what he does. It is his role in society. It is not just his job. It is who he is. Um, there is no retirement from being a knight. Um, if you are an old knight, you are still a knight and you still go out and you fight as a knight. Um, I, um, because there's no, there's no exiting that personal identity. I think about I think about the movie Yojimbo by Akira Kurosawa, which I, a movie I love. Mm -hmm. um, Yojimbo is a warrior, not a soldier. Right, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And uh, you know, one of the things I stress because that warrior identity is inherent in the individual. Um, a warrior is still a warrior when the war ends. A warrior is still a warrior fighting alone, right, away from a unit. Warriors can fight in units, but they can also fight alone. Soldier has a much more complicated um, etymology where we, we get that word. Um, it literally means one serving for pay. Um, its root is solidus, uh, a Latin word for a kind of coin. Um, you know, a, a, soldier, a soldier fights as a job. Uh, it's an occupation, not an identity. And that distinction between warriors and soldiers you see in many languages and it goes back greek and latin both have different words for soldier and warrior in latin latin has this distinction between milites soldiers and bellatores warriors uh, bellatores having the same sort of etymology a bellum in latin is war so it's warrior i mean very literally guys that do war roman soldiers are never bellatores they're milites um, milites has an interesting etymology too. It comes from the same root as our word mile, uh, which comes from the Roman word mile. Um, the same M-I-L um, in the front of million, which is a thousand thousands. Um, and it has that root that means a thousand. Um, in Latin, that root signifies things put together. A mile is a whole bunch of feet put together. And so milites are a whole bunch of men put together. Is military the same root? Yes, correct. Yes. Cool. Military is in a thing that is connected to milites, to soldiers. Um, and so milites are defined, soldiers are defined by their membership in a unit and their subordination to a community. Um, um, and this is true in English too. So we talk about a soldier. Um, when the war ends, a soldier, because it's a job, may go back to being a civilian. We have professional standing armies in many countries now. Um, but even then, most soldiers in the U.S. Army serve their tour and then go home. Um, and they do something else. Um, a soldier um, without his unit isn't a soldier anymore. Right? He's a wall in a way that a warrior cannot be. Um, and a soldier without a country, without a community he's subordinate to, isn't a soldier anymore either. He's a mercenary. And so, whereas a warrior can remain a warrior when fighting alone or when fighting only for himself, a soldier cannot. A soldier is only a soldier fighting in that job, during that conflict, for that community, okay, so of that's which cool. he is a member. But why is that important? Um, and... These are very different. These are very different roles in society that these individuals perform. Um, fundamentally, for a warrior, a warrior can't leave society or cannot leave the war behind. It is core to his identity, and he can't let it go. That, in a free society, is a dangerous thing. Um, by and large, in societies that have warriors, those warriors tend to be not merely the military elite; they tend to be the political elite. It is a short leap to say, I am the sort of special individual, the only one whom can fight. It is a short leap to say, my sort of special individual is the only one who should lead. Other individuals are um, unworthy of leadership. And I think actually in the United States, I think you see an uncomfortable drift um, in that direction. 
Um, we have now uh, broken the taboo against having um, former or active military officers as Secretary of Defense twice yeah. in four years. Um, there seems to be a real sense that only soldiers should sit as Secretary of Defense when it used to be only civilians should. Um, right. Uh, I've, I've always reminded of um, George Clemenceau's quip, war is too serious a thing to be left to military men. Um, um, but to a degree that that's true, and that's true for the necessary functioning of a society, soldiers are subordinated to the needs of the community in a way that warriors subordinate the community to their needs. Um, soldiers are servants, warriors, masters. Um, yeah. you, you write about it. You say a beautiful description. You say a modern free society has no need for warriors. The warrior is almost wholly inimical to a free society if that society has a significant degree of labor specialization and thus full-time civilian specialists. It needs citizens, some of whom must be at any time soldiers, but who must never stop being citizens, both when in uniform and afterwards. And I, th I think that's a, a very powerful thing. But I do think it's interesting, and I like that a lot, but I do think it's interesting to how much we glamorize the warrior. We don't glamorize soldiers so much in in – in the West, but the warrior has a certain heroic ethos, and it, it's a nice transition. We can talk a little bit about it if you want. Thinking about the the great warriors of antiquity and our cultural affinity for them, Achilles, Odysseus. Um, you know, I, I'm writing a book where I, I think I'm going to include the scene where Odysseus comes back to his waiting wife Penelope. To find about 108 people hanging out in his living room, wooing her. Not a pleasant situation. And, and he immediately kills them. He kills them all. Yes, he does. He gets he gets some help. His son and a servant do. There's three against 108, but as is often the case in cinema and other literary treatments, uh, that's no no problem. He's really good. And he, you know, the test that Penelope gives is just to string his bow. It's the only one right. who can do it. And a soldier doesn't have to string a bow, so I'll just give it a gun and just keep it clean, maybe. But but a warrior has to be able to string a bow, and a warrior's got to be able to to pillage the way um, uh, Achilles does. And and so, I'm I'm struck if we can stick on Odysseus for just sure, a second because ahead. I think it's a great example. I'm struck, of course. Odysseus is the man who cannot leave the war behind. Yeah, he brings it home with himself. He cannot help it. I'm always struck that, generally speaking. Modern adaptations, film, TV adaptations of the Odyssey end with the defeat of the suitors and the reconciliation of Odysseus and Penelope. That's not where the poem ends. Correct. The poem keeps going because Odysseus has just killed a hundred <laughs> men of the most prominent families of his kingdom. Yeah. And he's set up an almost immediate disastrous civil war. Odysseus's actions on going home in the poem are catastrophic. The gods, Athena has to intervene to keep Ithaca from ripping itself apart as a result of what Odysseus has done. And Odysseus in the end must leave. He has to go away again because of this violation that he has done. And we rewrite that story. Oh, we yeah. want that happy ending. Yeah, we do. There is no happy ending for Odysseus. And I think Athena, if I remember correctly, um... By the time he's killed everybody, they've mopped up the hall a bit, and he's gone upstairs to see Penelope. She's actually not sure it's him. It's been a long time, and he's got a scar that helps, but the way he proves his um, his identity is, is one, to me, one of the most beautiful moments in mm -hmm. literature, uh, which is basically he affirms the origin of their bed uh, yes. that he constructed. And, of course, it's, it's a beautiful uh, metaphor, but – it's late, you know, they haven't seen each other in a long time. And finally, I think she's convinced. And if I remember correctly, Athena extends the morning, not the morning, right. the night, the night, so they can be together for the entire evening, which is about to end. But she delays the sunrise so that they can have a, a night together, which has been interrupted by a little mayhem and little some skepticism <laughs> yeah. about who he is and some controversy over the scar uh, and that's a beautiful, happy ending. And I, I've never read past that, Brad. I confess, I'm not a, 
a great scholar of, of the Odyssey. I, there are parts I love. I read it to my kids, so many parts of it. Um, it's right, tremendous. It going. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, I'll, I'll get to that. I now, uh, for better, for worse, but yeah, but you're no, I mean, I like point, the happy ending too. Oh, who doesn't? Well, anyway, Homer didn't, but the, the point <laughs> I was making, and I want you to comment on is that we have this tremendous romance. I think about warriors because in, in most of human history, uh, and of course still true today, uh, death is lurking. Invasion is lurking. Destruction is lurking. It's common. It's it's part of the human experience, and the warrior has a heroic uh, role to play. And uh, you know, I've quoted it before in the program. Um, you know, Kipling's poem uh, about Tommy this and Tommy that and Tommy wait outside, but it's thank you, Mister Atkins, when the troops are on the tide. You know, we, we need the warrior when 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 our existence is at stake. So I think there's a a cultural. Uh, demand uh, of of that romance perhaps that that I understand you don't like I don't I don't like it either I don't think we should ever glorify killing but it's natural to glorify people who can who are adept and in the face of danger step forward uh, and I think that's part of what that warrior culture cultural iconness is about But I think there's a there's a disconnect there because if you're looking for someone to um, uh, you know stand on the wall, uh, that's not going to be a warrior. That's terribly boring. It's going to be a soldier. You're going to have to pay somebody to do that. More than one often because uh, they're going to get shot and replaced by somebody else. Right. Well, and you've got a lot of wall. Yeah. Um, and so um, you know, in the end, I, I think. Why the glorification of of warriors? And I mean, I think the answer, you know, you you brought up the Avengers earlier, and the yeah. Avengers are certainly warriors. Yeah. Um, the warrior gets to be special in a way that the soldier doesn't. The soldier serves the community, but the warrior stands over it. And who doesn't want that somewhere in their heart to be the special one, to be the fellow in the fancy armor and equipment who's different from everyone else? where soldiers have to be uniform in order to function, um, to be the one that's different, that stands out, that stands above. Um, what, what I pointed out in, in this series is that we all have that desire to be special, but that a lot of this warrior glorification channels that desire to be special in some pretty unhealthy directions. Um, that this ties into um, really the cult of machismo. There's a lot of, when you dig down into this warrior glorification, particularly the glorification of, we'll talk about, you know, the Spartans, um, uh, you know, and, and, and that kind of warrior national, glorification. And the National Football League. It's very similar, yeah. by the way. Less death, but a similar right. idea of, of the lone, even though they work as a team, we, we focus on the more distinctive players, who play right. injured, who in the face of age and and damage to their body still persist and 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 play on and succeed. That's that's a you know it's a, it's a tremendously common myth in in, in much of, of human history, I think. Right. Everyone wants to be everyone wants to be special. Um, what I find troubling about a lot of the sort of cult of the warrior is that um it channels that desire to be special towards this model of military masculinity, which one, as I note, is dangerous for a free society. Um, and two, frankly, if you so much as scratch the paint on it, it's also fascist. Um, and I don't mean that as like the political slur of things that are bad. I mean, it draws <laughs> upon sure. the specific tropes, imagery, oh, yeah. and world understanding that like underlied the philosophy of Benito Mussolini. Yeah, well, it's, um, I, think it's, I think it's worse than you're saying, actually, because you say that everyone wants to be special. I think there's also a part of us that wants to be subservient to a very strong person. And yes. the, you know, Adam Smith writes about this, get a little Adam Smith reference into an otherwise not so um, – economics oriented episode. Uh, but Anna Smith writes about our desire for to look up to the great to great people. Uh, and a warrior would certainly be in that in that category and not just look up to them, but to be willing to to suffer from their actions, right? 
I, I think if I remember correctly, he talks about the, in the theory of moral sentiments, he talks about, you know, the death of a really bad person, but a really successful person and how people are conflicted by that. And we see that in, you know, in modern Russia today with uh, the, the return of, of Stalinism, the of, not Stalinism, but the, the worship of Stalin or the respect for Stalin's like, really? But he was a warrior, by the way. You know, he, he it's the same ethos, I think, in many ways. And he wasn't just a warrior in battle. In theory, he was a warrior for the people. And that, I think, is is the most in dangerous. Theory. Yeah, right. and that's the most dangerous form, the, the willingness to to believe in that myth that that this, quote, great man, and it's almost always a man, is mm -hmm. going to be your, your savior. He's going to protect you. And then that he's going to take a slice of your of your uh, livestock. Well, it's worth it. Um, but anyway, we're almost out of time. I, I want to. I want to give you a chance to say something about Sparta. Now, I'm not a big Sparta guy. I've, I've 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 never seen 300. The only thing I'm embarrassed to say, but I'll share it. The only thing I know about Sparta is that allegedly, and you'll tell me if it's right or wrong. They used to put infants on hillsides to see if they were worth if they could survive, or maybe it's where they put it when they knew they wouldn't survive. They were a the uh, ladder. Uh, they were a brutal, uh, efficient war machine. Uh, they went, you know, they went undefeated and took seven Super Bowls in a row back in uh, in the day. And you suggest that this is not 100 percent true. Uh, I'm curious. Again, I think we have a need. It's the same reason I think we root. We root for the underdog, but occasionally we root for the for the overdog. We want we want that winning streak uh, to persist. We We like the idea of excellence and triumph and victory. But in the case of Sparta, it turns out maybe not true. Why not? Right, and we what? want the the Spartans have the advantage. They're supposed to be always outnumbered and yet winning oh, yeah. unstoppably. Right. Anyway. Right. Um, for the Spartan infanticide, I should note, uh, uh, complex uh, – our sources tell us this, um, that the Spartans exposed infants at a specific spot. Um, the archaeologists can't come up with any evidence for it, so the general thinking is that our sources may be making it up. But hard to find evidence, like you said. Some of these things are may not be easily hard to, but we should find lots of human remains. Oh, uh, oh that's true. Yeah, interestingly, maybe. we do find some human remains at the relevant spots, but they're not infants; okay. they're adults, uh, hmm. because that seems to have been like the execution hill that you throw people off of. Yeah. Um, hmm. But, but like, if they're doing it in any quantity, we should find a whole lot of infant remains, which we don't, which is raised questions to say the least um uh, about this tradition okay um but um but yeah no there is this reputation as the spartans as the sort of ultimate ultimate warriors and really that's just not what sparta is um you know the core thing that you really want to know about sparta the most important thing to understand about sparta um Sparta was an unusual society for Greece. All Greek societies had slavery. Um, slavery was a common institution in the, in the Greek world. Uh, Sparta was unusual in that the, the slaves in Sparta called the helots were an absolute majority of the population and not merely a majority of the population, which is probably not true in any other Greek state. Even in Athens, um, probably most of the population was free. Um, though perhaps not citizen. Um, but in Sparta, not only were the slaves a majority of the population, they were probably 70, 80 percent of the population. Hmm. Um, what had happened in Sparta was that the very wealthiest upper class in Sparta, the one percent almost literally, had successfully reduced literally everyone else in a society to slavery or there was a small group of, of a non-citizen underclass, the perioikoi such that the Spartiates, the tiny elite, now owned all the land, um, and that the Spartan state owned most of the people on that land. The Spartans then conquer the next valley over, Messenia, and they reduce them to the status of slavery too. Um, as a result, Sparta is by land area by far the largest Greek state in, in, in ancient Greece. Um, it's about a third of the Peloponnese, um, there are more than a dozen Greek states smashed into the other two-thirds of the Peloponnese to give an idea of just how bonkers huge Sparta is. Um, 
In terms of raw population, Sparta is probably the second most populous Greek state in Greece proper. Um, so we'd expect Sparta to be a prominent state no matter what. It's huge um, by the standards of Greece. I mean, it's tiny if you compare it to Persia, but it's huge <laughs> by the standards of Greece. Um, in contrast to what we see, Sparta is certainly a leading state, um, but the Spartans actually struggle mightily to exert um, their influence. One of the problems is that there are never very many Spartiates. When you have this incredibly unequal society, your elite at the top tends to be very small. Um, probably only about 5 to 6% of the population of Sparta were the Spartiates. About 10,000 adult citizen males at its height out of maybe 200,000 people, and that number declines over time quite precipitously for complex reasons we can leave aside for now. Um, but were they good fighters? Yeah, and the answer seems to be kind of, um, but not nearly as much as you think. Um, there is this popular idea that the Spartans had this rigorous training program. Uh, that's definitely not true. Um, the Spartans did not drill for battle. They did not train with their weapons any more than the rest of, of Greece. Um, the Spartan rearing system, the agoge, our sources are very clear, was a system for enforcing um, obedience and conformity. The what system? It was an, the what system? The agoge. No, what was the English version? Uh, is the Spartan rearing system. This is yeah. their education for okay. boys. Okay. Um, you're inducted at seven, um, and then and then you graduate as an adult. This is the way you become a Spartan. It's only open to those with Spartiate parents. We should know there's no external entrance into the Spartiate class. It does not matter how talented you are. If you were not born a Spartan, there is no way to become a Spartan. But um, it's really unequal society, I suppose, is what I should stress here. And um, um, But this, this rearing system, um, the agoge, it does not train them to fight. It enforces uniformity and conformity. Um, it is uh, more akin to a re-education camp than it is to a school um, or a training program. Um, now, what the Spartans did have was a fearsome reputation, um, and that reputation was powerful. If your enemy comes to the battle scared of you, you've already halfway to winning. And it is clear that the Spartans were a little bit better at holding together in combat, uh, their morale was a bit higher. All of that shared suffering in this really quite brutal education system they had tended to pull them together. Um, but it wasn't a huge advantage. If you inventory all of Sparta's battles, you find that they win about half of them, a little less than half. Um, Sparta bats about a 500. Um, they're about average. Um, if you move on from the battles to ask, right, battles aren't enough. You can win a battle and lose a war. You ask, does Sparta win its wars? Uh, and here the answer is really mixed. Um, the Greeks collectively um, successfully resist Persian invasion. Sparta is a part of that. That's good. The Spartans and the Athenians fight a war. It's really long. It's a lot longer than it should have been. The Spartans fight kind of stupidly for most of it. The Spartans do eventually win because Athens is fighting pretty much all of Greece. Um, and Athens is only one city. But after um, the defeat of Athens, the Spartan military record um, is really checkered. Actually, even before the defeat of Athens, it's fairly checkered. Um, so, Even so, what's what's the what's the story here? Why do we have this incredibly uh, unrealistic vision of Sparta as um, as a military powerhouse when, in fact, they're just run of the mill? Any thoughts on that? The Spartans get really good press in our ancient sources, <laughs> yeah. um, and part of the reason um, is who's writing our ancient sources and why. Um, our first set of sources about the Spartans, um, we'll put Herodotus to the side for a second. Our first big set of them are written by Athenians. Um, of course, Athens is the enemy of Sparta, and so you'd say, oh, these guys will be hostile. Ah, but who writes history in Athens? It's the elite. It is the wealthy class. People who, in a Greek city that was as unequal as Sparta, would be in charge, but Athens is a democracy. And so these men must serve the people. 
and they're terribly sore about it. <laughs> and so Sparta becomes the go-to comparison point for Athenian oligarchs to complain about the democracy. Um, much the same way, by the by, uh, uh, modern autocracies are the sort of go-to point for um, American technocrats to complain about the democracy. Yeah. Whether that is left-wing or right-wing modern autocracies, one sees that tendency. Um, so Sparta naturally gets good press from these fellows. Xenophon stands out sort of in front of them. Xenophon is quite hostile um, to the Athenian democracy, and he is very friendly with Sparta um, because he sees it. Sparta, after all, is uh, a place where an aristocratic warrior sort of fellow like Xenophon would be in charge. And I'm, the Spartans were in charge uh, in their society in a way that no other Greek was. It makes them really incompetent diplomats because they do things like backhand other national leaders because that's how they behave at home. <laughs> um, Cleomenes actually does this. He precipitates the war that breaks the back of Spartan power by punching the representative of Thebes over an insult. Um, Spartans were uniformly arrogant and violent. It was a product of the training that they underwent, this rearing system. It made them awful diplomats. That's fascinating. Um, uh, and relatively uncreative strategists. Um, well, let's, <clears throat> let's close with the um, why you care. So I care about things like this. I think I'm a little bit unusual maybe, but the truth seems, seems good. I like the truth. Uh, and I think some people go into history because they care about that. They want to, they care about it. But you know, some people listening might say, eh, "What's the big deal? We romanticize Sparta, or Athens, or Greece, or Rome. It's you know, it's all just it's a long time ago. It doesn't really matter." I'm sure you have. It's all, it's all ancient history. It's all ancient history. I'm sure you have students who 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 don't take your classes for that reason. There may be even a few who do, and you know resent having to learn about the, the, the real answer. Mm -hmm. um, you could say that about all of history, actually. It's not just about ancient history. You could say it's just storytelling. Some stories are useful. Truth is not so important. So how does a historian answer that question? I think I'm on your side, main... by the way. It's a rhetorical yeah, question. No, I, but... I think there are two main reasons that I would point to is to say why we want not merely a, a an account of the past, but a true account, as accurate as we can get it of the past. And there will always be layers of interpretation on top of that, of course, uh, unavoidable when you're dealing with humans. Um, the first, of course, is that we use the past as a model for future action. We use our thinking about the past as a way to think about what to do in the now. This is how we as humans make decisions. It's how we learn. As a child, you touch the stove, it's hot, you burn yourself, and you remember never to do that again. History is a sort of social memory in the same way. Um, the great Greek historian Thucydides lays out um, the purpose of his history in exactly these terms. I'm probably going to, to mangle the quote, but he says he's setting it out so that people will have an exact record to inform future actions. Um, and that this, he says, will be um, not an essay for the moment, but a treasure for all time. Um, and he so was onto something one there. Reason. <laughs> yeah, no, I think he has an idea. Um, I tend to cite Thucydides and not Herodotus as the first historian, but you can get into arguments about that. Um, note that that doesn't mean that Thucydides doesn't occasionally fib. Uh, he does. Yeah. He's just <laughs> he's just very careful about it. Um, but. Um, but so we use the past to frame modern thinking, and you can see this in the ways that we take what we imagine past warriors to be and use it to frame modern assumptions about manhood. Uh, we take assumptions about how immigration worked in the ancient past and try and ap apply it to the modern period. And so in that sense, getting the past right matters for how helpful and useful those comparisons will be um, to the present. Um, and so that exact knowledge is is important because the you know the uh, this is the Faulkner quote right um, you know the past is never gone it's never even really past um, 
I probably mangled that quote too. No, I think that's um, right. I think that I'm not sure. I didn't know it was Faulkner, but yeah, certainly true in his work. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then um, the other reason I think particularly to get the past right is that of course we also live in, live on top of, uh, for you uh, from, 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 you know, currently in, in Israel, literally on top of the world they built. Yeah. Um, and our world is shaped by their decisions in important ways. Um, and our world is, is structured after, after theirs. Um, you know, in the, in the United States, I mean, we have a Senate. Um, we have a government that was built as an effort to create a sort of perfected second Roman Republic. The founders were thinking about Athens and Sparta and Rome. Um, and indeed, they argued which one was better. Um, and that shaped some of their assumptions about the government that they were going to form, um, presumably. And then, of course, we are not only rooted in that. We are rooted in, in many traditions. And so we live both physically but also metaphorically atop the ruins of the past. And if we want to understand those foundations, we need to understand the past as it was rather than the past as it makes for a good Hollywood movie. My guest today has been Brett Devereaux. His blog is A Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry. Brett, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.